Guy Baxter has been University Archivist at Reading University since 2008. His responsibilities include caring for the Beckett Collection, the Archive of British Publishing and Printing, and the Archives of the Museum of English Rural Life. He has been an advisor on major research projects including Staging Beckett and the East London Theatre Archive. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. There's three major areas I'd like to discuss today. first one is the archive of British publishing and printing. It's the largest collection of its kind in the world, and perhaps you could tell us what's, what's in it. I think people often think it's, a, it's going to be a literary collection, but essentially it's a business archive. It's an archive of a series of businesses, publishing businesses and printing businesses, um, and occasionally of, of individuals relating into that, but mainly of, of the businesses. And so it's largely correspondence, because that's what the publishing business is largely about. Yes, there's a financial aspect, there's a production aspect, but mainly what this archive is about is about the publishing house, the editors, the publishers, corresponding with the authors, corresponding with the author's agents, corresponding with the author's estates, whatever else that may be, about everything that they, they need to. So quite often we talk about the, the kind of the, the files where it's, um, you know, where, why has my royalty check not arrived? Why is my book not selling? Yeah. Um, the hard-nosed business aspect of it. But sometimes it's much more about the content of the, of, of, of the book, about the struggles that the writer may be having uh, artistically, creatively. It's yeah, about so it's yeah. about process and it's about how, how you get this creative idea out of the person's head and into, into print. And the correspondence reflects that. I mean, you know, we, we haven't got the conversations, we haven't got the, the phone calls, the personal meetings, or, and so on and so forth. But I think because it, it is largely a 20th century, um, with, with some substantial 19th century as well, material, the correspondence is the best reflection of that you're going to get. And you know, in many cases, we've got the in letters, the letters sent by the author and, and the outlet, copies of the out letters right. sent by the publisher. So you, often you can see both sides of the correspondence, not always. And like all archives, it's patchy. Some things don't survive. We don't have every publisher, but we do have a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So, so anyone who's interested in literary biography is going to have so, a heyday. And yeah. that's a lot of the usage, it actually, yeah. is people coming in for, for literary biography. But I think you can go, can go beyond that as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, can, it can go to people who are looking at, at, at trends within, within publishing, who are looking at, at the book trader, but who are looking at readership, who are looking at, at, at receptions of different genres. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I can't quite characterise briefly all the, all the potential research uses of this because there are so many. And, and it's not narrow and, and literary also in terms of the types of publishers. And I think, you know, some of the ones we might pick up on might be Mills and Boone, who uh, obviously are, are, are genre fiction. Um, yeah, they did the romance. romance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes that surprises people that we collect that. And I suppose that's partly because... Although we're not particularly a literary archive, we do have literary collections as well, such as Beckett. So it, it, it seems a bit incongruous. But I think, but the archive of publishing and printing is something different. It's, a, it, it's, it's about, and perhaps accidentally to some extent, um, it, it's about looking at it from, initially at least, from the business viewpoint. But recognising at the same time that obviously a lot of the usage is going to be people who are interested in the authors. Mills and Boone, I think, yeah, the kind of literary publishers may have looked down on them a bit but because they were so sort of mainstream. But they had pretty high standards and they were hugely popular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I and think they, they were, were they bought out by Harlequin? Bought out by Harlequin and now subsequently by HarperCollins. So they remain part of the um, Murdoch Empire, I okay. believe, even after the uh, even after the the, the, the restructuring. Yeah, and, and in fact, they interesting. They're interesting because they started as, as a general publisher. So Jack London, they published Jack London. Now, you, you, that's a fair contrast, I think it's fair to say, to um, mm -hmm. to romance fiction. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, they're very interesting. They're interesting. Uh, it's interesting archive in terms of the the correspondence. Clearly, they had massive author loyalty. <laughs> But these, these authors that they had, they, they churned out 50, 100 novels, didn't they? they, they yeah, 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 and I suppose you know, there's a formula. I mean, you know, yeah. it's pretty open. There's a, there's a way of writing them, and people could pick that up and, and make a living out of it. It's interesting from the point of view of the archive because it's, it's one where we also have the books because generally we do have the files, the correspondence, maybe the accounts, ledgers, the production books, but not the books themselves, the, the outputs. And I suppose, yeah, that's, 
That's not unusual for a business archive. If you're the archive of Ford, you don't generally also have all the cars. <laughs> so generally, those those books would stay with the with the publisher, or to be honest, whoever's taken the publisher over. And that's called the file set of books. And those those are probably more useful to the business than um, in some ways than the correspondence. Um, you know, you need to to check back to the previous edition, or you need to see. Uh, what you've got and I suppose contracts are also something although we do sometimes have contracts here they're another thing that gets used quite a lot again that's quite unusual in publishing because of the term of copyright um, I suppose people are often looking at back at contracts that may have been signed quite a long time ago and thinking about what rights may have been assigned in different ways. Yeah, I think it's quite, it's, it's quite interesting in terms of how businesses use the information. But uh, the file set of books, we do actually have the Mills and Boone one, um, even though we don't usually take those, and that's because, that's because of the covers. Um, now, generally, you will find copies of Mills and Boone books in the British Library, but you won't usually find the dust jackets because the British Library and other big copyright libraries tended to remove those in the, in the 20th century, so in the middle part of the 20th century. We took that, that collection of, of the actual books because I think we thought that there's a lot of interest in the covers and also the, in, inside the, the flaps you've also got um, a, a little bit of blurb about the book as well you've got forthcoming titles so actually there's quite a, quite a lot of information in there that I think you would be lost if, you, if we'd let that collection go um, mm. so do, sometimes we do have the books as well You've also got uh, reader reports so you can see who made the mistakes you know, not publishing <laughs> Do you yeah. have any examples of... Yeah, I think, that, I think it's in the Chateau and Windows collection. There's a um, uh, rejection of Beckett's work um, as derivative of Joyce, as you imagine. I mean, Beckett was going around you know, all the publishers. But so did Joyce for that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. we had a kind of a, a, the standard writer's experience, I suppose, of being rejected by lots and lots of people. Um, so, so you'd see the rejection letters as well. So, yeah, well, that's always interesting, actually, is to see the contrast between the reader's report, um, which is obviously internal and private, and... Um, yeah, the, the more diplomatic way in which the publisher may well have phrased that. Yeah, so those are, those are interesting. They can be a, a, a little bit of a challenge. Obviously, you need to need to allow a certain amount of time to pass before they, those come into the public domain. How much time? Uh, that, that varies. I mean, I think it's uh, it's certainly difficult. To, to, I would suggest to do within the author's lifetime. But also the, the the readers. I mean, often the reader is someone. If the reader's identified, then often that can be that can be difficult. And they may be. And, and I've I've not seen specific examples here, but over. Over my career, I've seen examples of where you could see an author being rejected who then is accepted and then subsequently becomes a reader and is rejecting others. And I think that's quite an interesting kind of pathway, isn't it? I mean, yeah. the idea that you can Revenge. see... Revenge. Yeah, well, yeah. absolutely. But possibly without even the... You wonder, would, did they ever see the report on their own? Yeah, yeah. On their own, the, 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 you know, <laughs> did, they, did, they, did, they, did they see the... Or did they only get the diplomatic... More diplomatically yeah. worded letter. I, no. I don't know. It's quite yeah. something to speculate about. Um, and it's about these personal stories because you know all archives are about people. Yes, there's a very hard nosed business number crunching end of publishing, but a lot of it is about interpersonal relations. Yeah, and loyalty of the author to the publisher or publishing mm-hmm. house, or lack of loyalty. Yeah, and I think that's. I don't know whether that's changed. I mean. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, 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 the famous example that relates well to our archive is the story of Tolkien and his relationship with Rainer Unwin. And, of course, Rainer Unwin, as a schoolboy, was paid these, I don't know, a halfpenny to, to review books and reviewed The Hobbit and liked it, and then ended up taking over the business. And there's the idea that he's kind of dealing with one of the authors who he'd made while still in short trousers, while still a child. It's quite, it's quite an extraordinary kind of well, it was, story. I mean, it shows you the faith. That, that it was it his father that, yeah. that took his advice. Yeah. Because he was a kid and he was a typical of the audience that this book would appeal to, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a shrewd bit of business, isn't it, yeah. by Stanley Unwin to say, yeah. um, to, to say, well, I'm not going to review children's books myself. I'm going yeah. to get my children to do it. Yeah. Logical. But yes, then, to, then, to then believe him on the basis of that reader's report, it shows the power of a reader's report to some extent and where that can lead to. There's then a, a sort of a lifelong friendship, which is, you know, is hugely significant in terms of I'm not an expert on Tolkien, but um, hugely significant in terms of, of how those books were then subsequently published and how, how his work came to market. Well, his work came to market in that way and others didn't. I mean, that's, there's a bit of chance, isn't there? A bit of serendipity about all of this. And, um, and those are maybe stories that, you, that don't come out until you can study the archive, mm-hmm. um, until you can see who's rejected, until you can see who's, who nearly makes it. So you can have that context, then you can't... Do you have that? You can't understand the popularity of, of some. 
how many brilliant books are there that are, have just never quite found the right publisher at the right moment? Serendipity or the fact that you're connected with the right reader that, yeah. that makes, the, makes the thing go, right? Yeah, I know. The thing about the archive is it can... It may not tell the whole of that story. Like I say, it can't pick up the phone calls and so on and so forth necessarily. But, but it can start to, to throw some light on, on those things and on, mm. on, on those sorts of, of trends about who, who makes it and who doesn't. And I think that's quite interesting, actually, is, in terms of the research, is when people are asking questions not about why something happened or how something happened, but about how something didn't happen or why something didn't happen. Mm. And I think those can often be... Um, the more telling, but obviously the more difficult as well. <laughs> Trying to prove a negative is never going to be easy. So yeah, I mean, I think that, and I think, what, you know, why does the archive? Why does the archive exist? I think it exists because it exists to serve a kind of really big range of of interests. Starting with research, and research can take all sorts of forms. Um, so academic research can take all sorts of forms, but it, you may also have you know, popular biography and all sorts of other reasons why people are, are, are conducting research. Also, obviously, we're at university, so we, 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 we use this material in, in teaching. Yeah, does that affect... Uh, obviously, it would affect what's taught in the, in, in the classroom and, and differentiate the Reading University from, from others. Yeah, so um, I think being in a situation where, you can, uh, where you're studying in English literature and you can actually go and look at literary manuscripts, where you can go and look at uh, material that relates to the genesis of a book to the reception of a book you know, I think that's important and I think that's, that's, a, that's something that our students obviously benefit from having close by and I think that's, that's good but, and also on the printing side as well and I think because um, we have a strong type, typography department with its own strong teaching collection but again having the kind of range of examples of printing in terms of actual printed books but also, but also um, ephemera around, around printing and publishing is, is um, and Business records again around printing. You know, those are important aspects for, for people as they want to broaden and deepen their studies as well. But I think there's a th- sorry, if I may, there's a third aspect which is about a more general public audience. And I think that's one that perhaps all archives struggle with a little, unless they're particularly genealogical or, or, or particularly you know well connected to kind of big popular stories. But I think it's an important one is it is that general public audience. And I suppose the one where we've tapped into that the most is Ladybird. We're, we're riding a wave of nostalgia for Ladybird at the moment. But I think that's uh, it, it's important. There's a more there's a more general, broader audience for this sort of thing that people understand that this archive because we don't restrict it to academic research or, or, or to, to teaching. Or to Reading. We make this, you know, this archive is available to all and it's for, for everyone to understand, not everyone will want to, but there are ways to be into it. Yeah, which is great. I mean, accessibility is, is something that, well, the general public being able to come in and, and learn about what you have and in some cases touch it or obviously read it and, and just experience it. Just giving a greater audience to, to important documents in our literary history. Yeah, I think so. And I think that word, important, what, what's important, I think is also one that, you know, different things are going to be d- of different importance. So, I mean, one of my first acts on coming here was to, uh, and realising the Bodley Head archive was here, um, was to go and look up the Agatha, Agatha Christie file and see what it was in it, because I'm a, I'm a, a fan of Christie. Mm. And um, that's very, unfortunately one of those where's my royalty check type <laughs> files. So it's a little bit disappointing. Yeah. Uh, from, from, but that's from why she went, to, she went down on Lane too, didn't she? And, yeah, so she, the, yeah, absolutely. So she's, royalty she's, checks started flowing yeah, from she's, there. Yeah, she, 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 I think she only published the first five, five or six books with, um, with Bodley Head. So yeah, so it was brilliant though. I mean, actually, in terms of understanding that, that relationship and um, perhaps understanding why the success had come with the bodily head and getting that you know, clearly that that relationship wasn't right in some way otherwise there'd be a lovely file of flowing correspondence between them perhaps so there are things where you you know you, you don't necessarily know what people are going to be interested in and what's going to be important to them like i say at the moment we we're, we're in a situation where ladybird is extremely popular and it'd be interesting to think about how we would present that archive when that in 50 years time 60 70 years time when instead of people saying oh ladybird yes i had lots of those i grew up reading those people say oh yes i got a couple of those from my grandfather but i didn't people when people don't have that connection where people aren't where people are, are they're 
childhood non-fiction experiences coming from Wikipedia mm-hmm. rather than from small hardback books. Um, I think that will be interesting to see how what, what, what are the lessons that the archive teaches us at that point. I don't know what those will be. Well, let's get into the ladybird. They're the same age as Canada is, apparently. They, uh, the actual company started off in 1867, but the ladybird logo wasn't wasn't used until no, until the First World War. Yeah, so they, they start off as um, jobbing printer producing you know, account books, diaries, stationery in Loughborough um, in Leicestershire, a company called Wills and Hepworth, and then they sort of saw a bit of a, a, a way of keeping their presses operating, making a bit more money by um, uh, producing children's books. Not in the, in the format of Ladybird that people are familiar with, um, in a larger format. Um, they coin the, the, the brand, I suppose we call it these days, uh, Ladybird series. Eventually they get a bit of a logo. And then I suppose the, the, the big change comes where... And they're mod- moderately successful. The big change comes when they, during the Second World War, when they, um, for reasons to do with paper rationing, they settle on this on that format, that familiar kind of small hardback format with an illustration on one side and a text on the other. And that's because they take a standard, the largest standard sheet of paper that will go through their uh, presses and uh, use that to produce one, a single 56-page book, including cover and paste downs. Yeah, so that one sheet of paper produces the entire book. Yeah, and it's a kind of a, when you look at one... You, you think, how on earth do you fold and cut that to make it? <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a geometric challenge that is beyond me and uh, um, uh, it's beyond most people. Um, so there's, there's some wonder to that, actually. And um, so having done that, they, that, that's, that kind of gives them this kind of cheap to produce because they keep the prices low for a very long time. Mm. Two and six, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, mm. so they keep these, these low prices. Um, so they've got this cheaply produced, you know, they're a printer. So they know printing. Uh, cheap produced book. Um, they carry on doing children's stories and so fiction. But then the, the other, the, the next kind of big move is when they um, is when they then move into nonfiction, and then and, and then again they then move into um, into a reading scheme uh, over keywords um, movement. The idea that you learn language by learning fifty to one hundred key, key words of, of English, and that that makes up a huge proportion of the certainly of spoken English. So they move into a market that's, uh, that's, I suppose, they almost create a market for, for that kind of inexpensive non-fiction. And then, and then the reading schemes as well. What age typically are they targeting? So targeting um, primary, primary age children, mm-hmm. um, so elementary school children. Um, that's, that's mainly where they're going with it. And some of them, you can see, do work for the older, um, the older readers. So, I mean, something like the Great Civilizations series um, certainly would, would probably be more uh, secondary age. And, of course, what you find when people tell the stories is, is quite often people say, well, of course, I, I, I learned computing from, from this book as an yeah. adult. You know, that's, the that's, rarest, that's the rarest one. The yeah, the computer. Book, yeah, people love it? it. I mean, people love this sort of... Sort of and, you know, and a lot of this is about, you know... Or the, the the police use the um, you know the, the mechanics in the police use the motor car book to you know, all these sorts of things are and there's a nugget of truth in those they are well written and they're, they're they're done in this way and I think what's interesting now is that with the expert series is they're almost trying to say well actually can we make these work as grown up non fiction uh, introductory uh, books and that's I don't know the figures on those. Um, I think what we do know is that they can make them work, work as spoofs. <laughs> um, but can well, they make them work as... Can the expert series work as that? Is a, I, think it's really, I think it's really interesting. But it's interesting that they've, they've seen two aspects recently of, of Lady Bird uh, as being, having potential now. One being, let's play on the fact that our illustrations now probably look a little bit dated to do something really funny. Big success. And then let's... Kind of a parody. Yeah, the parody, which is and, and 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 they are brilliant parodies. But then let's see what we can do in terms of does this actually work for a grown-up audience? Because people talk about these kinds of things. People say, you know, you know, during the Falklands War, the British Army issued Ladybird books because they didn't have any way of reading maps, uh, yeah, a, a yeah. manual for reading maps. Don't know whether that's entirely true, but I'm putting in mind of Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah, yeah, huge adult audience for that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think people have seen that there might be a crossover in key, 
you know, Penguin have spotted that as well. And, and yeah, it's, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see that whether, whether that creates a new, a new market, because that's what, they, that's what they're, they're trying to do. But they've been successful in the past. They, like I say, I mean, they, and they had a really great run with those, book, with those little books. Well, and they're hugely popular <coughs> with uh, collectors, obviously. Yeah. How many... There's, first of all, a whole bunch of different series... And then how many, do you have any idea of how many in total are they produced, books? Uh, like 5,000 or yeah, something like it's, that? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. We can go and have a look. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, because there's a, there's a permanent exhibition here. There's a permanent exhibition, um, but yeah, there are about... So, so, so what, what, what is the Lady... So the Lady Bird archive here is very unlike the other publishing archives, because it's the artwork. So it's about 18, I haven't counted them, 18, 20,000 artworks, 750 boxes of artwork. So, 56-page books, so, you know, 23, uh, 26 artworks. I can't remember whether 56 pages include the title <laughs> page or not. But uh, it's 26, I think, is how it works out in terms of the, um, <clears throat> the number of illustrations. And then we also have the, the, the books to accompany them as well. So it, but we don't have the correspondence. In most cases, we don't know about those relationships, or we only have limited evidence about those relationships between <clears throat> the publisher... In this case, I think we can say almost say the printer, the publisher, and the printer are almost are the same people in this case, and the authors of the text and the and the illustrators. And obviously, they had you know what they were doing very much was commissioning, so c- commissioning the written text as well as commissioning the illustrations. Mm. So it's a different relationship from the one you'd expect to find in, in, in one of the other archives. Um, yeah, but even so, there's a story there. Yeah, yeah. It's driven more by the printer and publisher, the the, the subject matter, than the author. Yeah, someone's yeah. someone's sitting there and saying, "We want to have a book on weather because, and, and after weather, we want one on chemistry, yeah. uh, and after that, we want one on physics." Or, and not, you know, that, those, someone's making those sorts of decisions based on probably pretty hard nosed business, maybe, but you know, they're generally a mix. You know, there's a certain element of creativity in there as well. Um, and sometimes they're taking a punt, and and is then saying, well, who's the best person to write that? Who's the best person to illustrate it? And some of and the can we get them at the price? <laughs> right. Yeah. And they got some pretty good illustrators. They got some good illustrators. Yeah. And obviously, you know, that's always they had regular work for people, so mm. people love to work for Ladybird. Um, so yeah, Charles Tunnicliffe and CB, people like that are uh, are amazing. Um, John Berry with his kind of photo realism. I mean, it's just you know, it's just extraordinary. You look at you look at those illustrations, you can't quite imagine how it's, how it's been painted, <laughs> how it's not actually a, 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 a photograph. Um, you kind of think, well, if it was glossier, it really would be. What so, was the printing like? Was it, was it good quality printing or not? It's, it's okay. I mean, there's nothing quite like... I, I don't know, I'm a bit spoiled because I get to look at the original artwork. I often look at the books and think, oh, well, I know that's a bit... F- I know this is not... Of course, it's of course it's been half toned. You know, gone through the it's gone through a, a process. Of course, it's not as good as the, looking at the original illustration mm-hmm. that's been sitting in a box, you know, well preserved for forty years or whatever else it may be. So, yeah, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about how how good the colours are. But mm-hmm. if the illustrations weren't good enough for then something like for something like British birds and their nests, something like that, it would have failed because they're trying to reflect nature um, and they're producing guides that might be used you know, for bird spotting and these sorts of things. So you need to have, you can't have rubbish colours. You've got to have something that's of pretty good quality. Mm. Otherwise, you, otherwise, people just wouldn't have bought it. Then it would just be, it would, it would languish. So I think, I think, yeah, pretty good for the price. The first book in the line was, are you going to have to help me here, Bunnikin's Picnic Party? Yeah, so Bunnikin's, which we've got on display in the gallery, is, um, so, so again, they're, they're just, all they're doing is they're picking up their larger format children's fiction and they're just rolling that across to the new format with bunnykins um, and so then the, the changes come when they move into non, non-fiction um, that was in 1940 though that, that uh, bunnykins yeah, yeah so yeah. that's because of paper rationing and that's, that's entirely because of that and it was an instant success and it, it built on the appeal of animal characters yeah absolutely I mean they carry on doing that sort of thing you know <clears throat> Lots of people come. They, they come to me, and they're, they're interested in the, uh, or they're collecting, or they're <clears throat> not nostalgic about the, the fairy tale series in particular, mm-hmm. um, but also some of the other um, <clears throat> animal character. Everyone, everyone wants to have the 
in children's fiction, everyone wants to have Peter Rabbit. I mean, that's what that's what people are after. I, I, I suppose that's that's no different even today in terms of children's fiction, small children fiction. And that was who's that published by? You remember? Warren. Warren. That's right, because they they made a movie out of that. There's a movie coming out. Yeah. There, there was one already on on Beatrix Potter. Oh yes, there's one on Beatrix Potter, and then there's a Peter Rabbit film about to come out, I think. Oh, that's right, the animated one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you, you talk about moving into non-fiction, and that would include things like hobbies and history and travel, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think what's, one of the things that's interesting about that is that, I suppose when you're writing children's non-fiction, people are quite conservative in how they write it, small c conservative. It's not full of dangerous ideas, <laughs> I suppose that's... That's Very conservative, then, and uh, yeah, establishment. Yeah, it's pretty establishment. I mean, it's, you know, if you're an author at the time, but also produce one of these things, you know, you're going to go from standard textbooks of the time, and so you're going to naturally be reflecting not necessarily the latest ideas, but perhaps it may change, maybe slightly different in the scientific and technical ones, but certainly within things like within the history, you know, it's, it's written in a particular way. And I think it comes out very strongly. It's difficult, because we're reading with hindsight, when you look at the travel series, the flight series, which is, the premise of which is... Two children go off to various, well, at the time it had been exotic places from the UK. So to North America, to Australia, to um, Africa, to Israel um, and to India. You read those now and you think, uh, and you know, they, they, they reflect a worldview that is, is, is massively changed. You know, the encounters with indigenous people, with people of different races, are written in a way that would now be pretty outrageous. Can you give an example? My, well, I suppose the, the example would be the, uh, the USA example, which is when they're in the South and they're talking about uh, the legacy of slavery, I suppose, the children. If you think about this, this is extraordinary. I mean, people didn't do long-haul travel for, for holidays and touring around at that time unless you were pretty rich. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting premise. So these children are kind of... Ex- so they're putting it through the eyes of children and the children are asking questions. Um, and so they're asking about the, the kind of the slavery and the Civil War. And... They're pretty much told, well, yes, slavery was a terrible thing, but we had a, there was a very big war, and uh, and we got rid of that, and now everyone lives in peace and harmony. And you sort of think, this is this is when, this is being published in the early sixties. You know, the civil rights movement is exploding around them, and, yeah. and yet there's this kind of uh, closed, slightly cosy world. But you know, if you think about, if you if if, if we empathise and we put ourselves with that with that author, you know, had they gone and you know, did, what did they know, or were they working from from other sources? Where were they picking up these things? What were they? What were they imagining? What, what news were they getting out of America? Yeah. Well, maybe uh, the from kids, the mainstream they, media. They didn't want to upset the kids at that age, too. I suppose. No, but I mean, I suspect it was partly that. But I suspect it was also partly what did people actually? You know, what was he filtering through into the UK into the UK media about yeah. about these kinds of things? Things yeah. are, were happening, but perhaps you know we're so used now, I suppose, to that instant kind of twenty four hour rolling Twitter media. It, it would have been. They, they may not just not have been aware of, of things that were outside of, I suppose, what I suppose we call the, the official kind of story of, of reconstruction um, in in America. Which um, and, and and that's kind of, so that's what comes through. Yeah, um, I mean, previously unheard voices, or now we we hear them now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not maybe doing a whole a lot with that, but. We're hearing them at least now. I think that's true. I think that is why it's difficult to, to judge those kinds of those kinds of books. But you know, at the same time, you know, it is pretty it is pretty shocking and outrageous that in the early sixties someone could be yeah. you know, that could be the official line. I think I mean, it has I think it's you know, the power of publishing here, writ large, because you know, if you think about those those sorts of books, children read those at the time in the UK. Mm-hmm. And therefore, built up a picture of America that was that was perhaps um, perhaps slightly skewed and, and yeah, the, harmonious. The, and, yeah, and one thing we know about Ladybird's books is that they keep getting passed down. I'm sure all the Ladybird books that I read were way out of date by the time I got by the time I got to them in the second hand market yeah. um, as, as a child. You know, you'd get something that was that was twenty years out of date. Yeah. Even at the time, I remember reading them and thinking, "I'm sure fire engines don't look like that anymore." Yeah. But you kind of knew that it was a little bit of an old book and it didn't quite wasn't quite relevant. So it's quite interesting how those those things. I mean, sometimes it's the example I, I use is um, is from my favourite labour, which is Richard Richard the Lionheart, and uh, uh, Dugard Peach, who wrote who wrote that. Uh, he's he's a bit naughty because he has an illustration showing the encounter between Richard and Salahuddin 
And then in the text, it says there are lots of stories about Richard. And one of them is that he met with Saladin and they had this exchange where um, Saladin cuts a silk scarf with his... and Richard breaks an iron bar with his swords, with their swords to show the kind of a, a contrast um, of fighting style. It's from Walter Scott. It's made up. <laughs> I mean, it's completely made up. Right. And I kind of look back at that now and think, I'm sure I, as a child, I thought that was real. Well, it's, 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 un, it's in a non-fiction treat, section, It's in a right? non-fiction book. Yeah. They kind of, yes, they have, you, when you look at the text now carefully, you say, oh yeah, I can see what he's done there. He's kind of said that. They put a picture of it as well. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> right. they, you know, they put pictures of people. Fake people. news, yeah. back then. Do you know, oh, that, I, hadn't, I hadn't actually put it into the fake news category, but that's, that's yeah, it's sort of, it's old news by then, I'd say. Yeah. Um, yeah, those, so there are things with where you could criticise in terms of, of how they approach the, the, the children's um, uh, children's literature. And, and, you know, it's maybe the fashions at the time. Yeah. Um, well, it gives you the main, mainstream view of the world. Yeah. That, that's what it does. And I think that makes it interesting. Yeah. I think that makes it interesting for beyond the, the nostalgia time and beyond the the time of the parodies and beyond all those, all those things that we're currently enjoying actually, and, and enjoying having that kind of that that enthusiasm coming out. Yeah, I like it. I'm enthusiastic for it. But there's something where you kind of say, well, actually, this is this is interesting because this is about that late 20th century worldview. Yeah, and, and whitewashed how, view. Yeah, and yeah. how and how hard that is to change. Yeah. I suppose, and how well, especially as it's been inculcated into this. Very, these very porous minds, you know, who uh, I would think accept pretty well everything as, as, yeah. as so, truth. So if in 1963 you're, you're presenting a 1950s worldview mm -hmm. of, of America, view of America, or even a 1930s view of America, I mean, you know, it's like 20s view, to a 10-year-old, by the time that person is then speaking to their children, that's a very old view of the world. Yeah. Um, that you're presenting, so you know you're creating, but it happening through children's literature. I suppose you're creating that, and that's why that's why that's one of the reasons it's interesting is because you are is about young minds, and therefore I suppose it has that that, that interesting uh, longer term influence. It takes longer for us, those things to <coughs> to come to fruition. So they're very collectible, and it's kind of an inexpensive hobby still, right? They're not. Uh, I mean, you can get them for ten to fifteen pounds, except for the ones that are rare, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think not even are, that much. I think people are yeah, and and and, and there are a lot of them, and you know, and they they're great fun, and I think they're brilliant. I mean, people. I mean, the reason we have a Ladybird Gallery here is because of the centenary. There are some really big exhibitions. There's um, a book, as you say, that came out, and a book that came out as well. So, um, Ladybird by Design um, by Lawrence Egan came out. So there were some really um, uh, some really big shows, and a lot of the artwork from here was was out on loan for that. But we wanted to do something ourselves, yeah. and um, we couldn't do anything on that sort of scale. But we can at least uh, start to present the collection in in some way that's. Uh, we can, you know, over the years, we can keep changing it. We can show more and more and more. We can show different stories. We can bring out different aspects of it. Yeah. So it's exciting for us as well, and nice to nice to have to bring the the publishing, printing and publishing archives to a general audience. Right. Uh, Which is what we're trying to do right here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just in in uh, winding down a bit, I should just mention getting back to the publishing and printing archive. Here's, here are some of the better-known publishing houses that are held here. The papers are held here. George Allen and Unwin, George Bell and Sons, A&C Black, Bodley Head, Jonathan Cape, Shadow and Windus, the Hogarth Press, Virginia Woolf, Longman Group, Macmillan and Company, Mills and Boone, and Secker and Warburg. So, you know, you've got some big... big. What about the, the, the ones you don't have? Do you covet those? Do you... Are, are you able? To, are you still on the on the hunt to, to complete your list? There are probably still some out there. Paper archives. I think what the big challenge for me is now is going to be digital. Most archivists are aware that you can't you can't get everything, and you certainly can't get everything into one institution. Yeah. It has to be collaborative. So I think the ones that get away, if they go somewhere where there's still public access, where people can still get it, that's not the end of the world. Naturally, archives are diasporic. You send a letter. And that letter is probably going to be, you know, in the archive, end up perhaps in the archive of the recipient. They send you a letter, their letter's going to end up in your archive. There's a diaspora there. People are sending communications in different places. So it's a collaborative business. 
So I don't think it's necessarily a case of asking. It's not a competition, but maybe it is. It is and it isn't. It, it isn't. is between the America and Great Britain, it seems, or, you know, the Americans have come over here over the last century and just pillaged, uh, especially big-name authors. I think, I think one of the interesting things about publishing archives is that we can... Um, we perhaps go a little a little below the radar in terms of the, um, the, the 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 literary heritage business. We're on the edge of it, I suppose. We're, we're perhaps more in the middle of it with the Samuel Beckett papers, but with the archive of British publishing and printing, the the costs are about the storage, are about the processing, they're about the about those sorts of things. That it's not so much about. Yeah, there is market value, but that market value is 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 going to be more limited than it would be for a manuscripts of an author um, no books of an author and yeah I think that's it's more affordable for you yeah it's more affordable and it's uh, it's it, it's more doable and I think you know uh, it's um, I don't know I mean I think it's very it's always very difficult with where uh, public archives come up against uh, something that's much more of a of a market and you see the same in in art you know suddenly there's a mass movement to save a particular painting or whatever for to be in a particular place or these kinds of things. And um, those things are very hard to predict. They're very hard to, they're certainly very hard to uh, manipulate and, and manage. I think you just have to do the best you can to try to ensure that, that as much of the heritage that, that's important is able to survive. And, in, the, um, in the place that it's originated? Ideally, I suppose you would. As long as it's protected and publicly available. I think that's more important. Yeah. Well, issues of, of repatriation and, and, and those are, are always going to be argued over. I, I suppose we, we have a slightly odd, odd view of it here in, in some ways. I mean, the archive of British publishing and printing is about British publishers, but what's a British publisher these days? I mean, let's take Mills and Boot, taken over by Harlequin and then by Harper Collins. What does that count as? I, well, that's I don't, it. I don't know. Would it, I mean, it's all, it's all international now. I mean, you know, the, we have the Museum of English Rural Life, as you've mentioned at the beginning, and uh, some amazing archives from there. Um, and that includes records of, of farmers from different farms around the country. Now, some of, the, some of those uh, county record offices are probably a bit... Certainly in the past, they've probably been a bit uh, surprised that, that records of, that, that are local to their area might end up here in Reading. So, you know, what point do you say, well, actually, this is, this is something where we need to put them together under this heading, and what point do you say we need to put them under here? Now, to some extent, I agree with you. I think, I think rich institutions coming in and, and just cherry-picking certain things is, does skew the way in which uh, archival research might happen. But most people who are studying these kinds of things for research are, needing, are going to need to travel a certain amount anyway, or are going to have to rely on uh, transcription, photocopying services. So I don't think it's quite a disaster in terms of academic research. I think where, where perhaps I'd question it is around community ownership, feeling of ownership of those, those heritage assets. And I think, so I, I, mean, I think it would have been, you know, Ladybird is hugely British. But so and so does Ted Hughes, and he's, yeah. he's in Atlanta. Yeah, but Ted Hughes is read everywhere. So yeah, well, exactly. So you could have those kinds. You could have this. So Ladybird is hugely British. So it would be, be very odd in my, in my view to kind of to not be able to do this kind of public public thing. I mean, who's studying Ted Hughes's papers? Who's looking at the Who's looking at the manuscripts? Is is that getting a you know? Is that something that's um, uh, that would be getting an audience here? That's a that's a big general public audience. And I think in the end, those things become political, don't they? They become, to what extent do, does a nation, does a community, does a society feel that it wants to, that that's a bit of a heritage that needs to be ours. I always find it, it's, we often, often, often it's over a Titian. <laughs> I always think it's interesting when they say, well, this Titian must stay in the UK. And you think, well, I'm sure he didn't work here. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, but it's been here. Yeah, so it's an associational value rather than, a, rather than a, where it was produced. Um, so it's kind of it, or, or, or to do with nationality. So I, it, it's a very it's a very difficult yeah. one to, to argue from that point of view. Didn't the British government? I don't know who makes these decisions, but the British government just stepped in to get a ring from Jane Austen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's always yeah, there's, there's export stops and things like yeah. this, where, which 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 from time to time happen. We we talk about um, University of Texas at Austin, who've obviously got a lot of literary papers that they've gone but they've also pulled in a lot of um, papers that you would consider to be um, you know, Robert De Niro papers you know, you'd, you'd associate him very strongly with New York you kind of you could you could say well he seems that seems a bit strange thing to have in in Texas which yeah. is 
Yeah, as you almost say, as far from New York as London is. Yeah, <laughs> it just gets to be, you can make an argument for everything not being where it is. Yeah, absolutely. money is the draw. It's not you know a yeah, location. And, and and I want to be clear, you know, the work that Harry Ransom Centre have done in terms yeah. of literary heritage is remarkable. And in, terms yeah. of other, and in terms of other other aspects of heritage, is remarkable. Well, plus and it's the, an amazing place. And yeah, they, that's right. The critical mass they have there is. Allows the scholar to, and I think that you know, if you look at something like the Museum of English River Life or um, the Archive of British Publishing and Printing, those are what it, those are what they have perhaps not on the scale of Harry Ransom Centre. But we have a certain amount of critical mass that enables people to come and do different things and to, to make comparisons and to yes. uh, and, and to think in slightly perhaps in slightly different ways from if they were having to. You can, you can spend some days here, and then maybe you get more serendipity in terms of people's discovery, and, and that's. That's where real discoveries can be made um, from from historic collections. I think. So I think there is. I think there's an argument both ways. I don't. I, I, I don't buy the argument that, that things have only one place where they sit. Okay. Finally, on on Beck, the Beckett collection, it's the world's largest collection of resources relating to Samuel Beckett. It originated in an exhibition uh, held in the Reading Library in 1971. Uh, which contained material donated by Beckett himself, and he continued to donate material until his death in 1989, and it's constantly being added to. Can you just, because you're familiar with it, are there any discoveries that have jumped out at you that uh, have been exciting and and, uh, worth uh, telling people about? I mean, people are always making discoveries because there's a lot of people studying it. What have you got here? So what we've, what we've got is a lot of the a lot of the manuscript material, and most of it did come from Beckett himself. But um, uh, but there were also some a few strategic purchases, such as the Murphy the Murphy manuscript, his first novel. Uh, there's also correspondence, and again, that, I mean, the correspondence is a really interesting one because again, the correspondence is everywhere, as you can imagine. He wrote a lot of letters, but there's been this amazing that amazing uh, publishing project to, to to publish selection of Beckett's correspondence, which I think is a fourth volume, and. Again, it, it's only by people bringing together that material that you start to, to, to people start to make discoveries. Mm-hmm. So people are making discoveries all the time, but they're making them perhaps over a very long. You know, it's not a eureka moment always. It's, it's over a long period. People are people are studying and finding different things. I mean, I think what what Reading did, and it was partly to do with again, always comes back to a personal relationship between an academic here, James Nelson, who who uh, bef- put on the exhibition in seventy one, and then befriended Beck, became a friend of Beckett's. Um, and, and he'd go out to Paris and Beckett would meet him in a pub and there'd be a carrier bag of precious documents handed over and those would then come back and go, go into the library and, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was then formalised and so that was, it, it was a relationship that worked. I suppose, that, you know, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, we gained these literary manuscripts but they were coming from a point of view that was where, where the direction of Nelson's work was very much about biography. That's right, um, because he wrote... He wrote Damned to Fame, which was the kind of authorised biography that came out not long after Beckett's death, so you know that's why he was going to see Beckett. That's why that's what they were doing. They were building up that friendship that you get can get between a biographer and a, and a, and a subject. So it's, come, it's not come necessarily from so much from the literary side. It's almost kind of like a byproduct. And so, but what what it's led to, I think, and this is important, I think, in terms of of the two sides of literary scholarship, it's led to a really archive led scholarship at Reading. Where it's about the it's about the text it's about it's about studying those archives it's about studying the man and how he worked and, and what he was putting down on paper, as well as looking at the theory and not just looking at the theory. And I think you know a lot of Beckett studies has been about uh, has been about theory. And I suppose that's that's the, the, you know it's, it's just an interesting I think it's an interesting angle on it. It's great as an archivist to see that happening because you can see it happening in front of you in the reading room. You can see people coming in and and studying and saying, "Well, I thought this about Beckett, but now I can see." something on the page about how he worked. Well, give me an example of like, <coughs> what, coming to Reading, you know, what's that going to uh, give me versus just reading Endgame myself and talking about it with a okay. professor? So, you can see drafts. <laughs> you can see drafts. You can so see, you can see how, thinking, how you can see his thinking involved. So if you look at the first know, 20 pages of Murphy, it's crossed out. It's, it's crossed out, sometimes double crossed out, sometimes heavily crossed out. Now, I'm not a Beckett scholar, but whoever you're studying, there must be value in seeing their first novel and their first attempt at that 
that they then reject and how they move on. You, see, you can, you know, you, that, that development of the mind and to see that across a large number of works, to be able to make those comparisons and also to look at things like notebooks and to be able to compare back where he's making references in the, in the work and then you can see, oh my goodness, that's, he's making, made a reference to that there and, and starting to piece together how that happens. I think that's, yeah, I think that must be, um, that must be pretty exciting. I, I know it's exciting because lots of people come and, and, and look at it and, and lots of people publish about it. And, and that's mm-hmm. not, that, that sort of thing doesn't happen just because you happen to have an archive. There are lots of archives that sits on shelves and sit on shelves and no one mm-hmm. comes and looks at. There's something in that grouping of material that means that it, it, it's partly, I think, about critical mass. It's about being, well, but it's also about just the, the depth of it, the, the depth of what, what those literary manuscripts can really tell you. You know, this is going way further into the creative process than, the, than, than most of that um, author editor correspondence, mm-hmm. where sometimes that does get into that. Um, what about his, his life itself? I, I know I've, I've read one biography, as I mentioned, and one of the things he used to do when he was a kid, apparently, is jump from way, way up high in trees and jump and jump out without any kind of protection on the ground or anything. He just... He was very, that, ener- he was very energetic. I mean... He, but he's energetic, but fearless, too. Yeah, yeah. So, but do you get that out of the archives? Like, is there anything in there that you can point to? No, it's, uh, it, it's largely... It's largely literary. I suspect that to the extent that that's come out in the biographies, it's come out from, from interview. But I think he is an amazing figure. And I think one of the things that I always loved about him is just that, um, is that sportiness, mm-hmm. that cricket, and all, 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 all that stuff that, um, that he was into. Because it's, it's such a positive and life-affirming thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suppose we, we kind of have, there's a kind of a... a uh, natural perception of Beckett as a bit of a miser- miserableist, and um, so thinking about the young man, it opens the mind a little bit. And also thinking about his time in the French Resistance, I think is extraordinary, and and that you know, being effectively on the run um, from from the Nazis, and his relationship with Joyce and, and Joyce's daughter too. That these are all again, is this covered in the archives? Or yeah, again, no. This, that that type of personal material wouldn't uh, wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be there. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think certainly his, um, his friendship and his admiration for, for Joyce and his, his friendship with the, for the fam- with the family in, in general, I think, was kind of... Beckett, by all accounts, and meeting was a, you know, a, a tremendously generous man, um, generous with his money to, to a fault. Um, I think p- p- perhaps one of the things he admired in Joyce was not just the, obviously, his brilliance as a writer, but also, you know, Joyce's kind of position as a family man because I think you know that was that's the, that's an interesting thing about uh, about his relationship with Joyce I think is just that um, the, the fact that there was um, there was a family around him I suppose you can sort of see Beckett kind of hovering on the around the edge of that he he was an exile and I think we've <laughs> really, they're two exiles and I suppose what do you do you, you you people club together and try to find common bonds don't they and I suppose that's um that's that's true of anyone in any circumstances where they're where they're exiled. But where uh, isn't it just remarkable that those that those people kind of came together and were learn well? I, I suppose some learning may have been one one direction, but perhaps to, to an extent learning from each other. I'm aware that although what we have mainly is the, is literary papers, the biography of the man is is also really important. The Beckett the person is something that's good. And again, it's one of those ones where you sort of think, well, how how do we make these these papers go beyond an academic audience, in, uh, beyond a student audience, which is big and you know, it's a huge audience, but how, and an important one. But how do we go beyond that? And I think I think that story of you know, Beckett as a person, I think, is actually is actually where that might happen. I think that's that's where I can see there being a, a wider engagement. Because I think it's a story that, although it's been told, I think it could be retold and retold and retold and and and, and gain every time. Where do we go? How do we? How do we find out more? So if you search for University of Reading Special Collections, then that's, uh, that's our website, and you'd find um, loads of stuff about, uh, about the collections that we hold here. And then it's open to everyone. Um, you can inquire by email. You can in- inquire um, by coming in and seeing us. 
What's the website? <laughs> it's right. it's www.reading.ac.uk forward slash special collections. No, it's not special collections. It's special dash collections. I'm going to check it now. <laughs> special dash <laughs> collections. <laughs> and we're also on Twitter as well. Google University of Reading Special Collections. Can't, can't go far wrong. Okay, that. good. <laughs> good. Thanks. I've been talking to Guy Baxter, who is the archivist at the University of Reading. Thanks very much. Thank you.